Everybody's very welcome here today to the National Graves Association to commemorate the beginning of the Civil War, one of the most important and tragic events in our country's history a hundred years ago on the 28th of, of June, of July. Um, it's very important to point out from the beginning that the National Graves Association is an independent organisation and has no affiliations to any other groups or political parties. It's been that way for nearly 150 years since the Graves was initially established as the Young Irelanders Graves and Monuments Committee back in 1872. The, uh, that committee at the time set out to find and properly mark as many Patriot Graves as they could. Many Graves of the 1798 period in particular were lost because the Irish people were forbidden on pain of death to mark the graves of volunteers of the United Irishmen. For obvious reasons, the society ceased to function between the years of 1916 and the end of the Civil War. However, it came back together again in 1926. People like Kathleen Clark, whose husband and only brother had been executed in 1916, with people like Joe Clark, who had fought at Mount Street Bridge, and the very much respected Republican Sean Fitzpatrick. And they brought about rules and regulations at the time to ensure that the National Graves Association going forward could always maintain its independence. So from that day to this, the National Graves Association accepts no monies whatsoever from any political party, government or arm of government. So the association is reliant on people like yourselves, our own members and supporters, for all the work it does. Now today's event, we'll have our uh, oration that will be given by Dr. Tim Horgan, our Kerry representative from, uh, from, uh, from the National Graves Association. I'm going to read out a note because there's a flag here that uh, Peter Kelly is holding. It's the, Peter's going to unfurl it now. It's the Irish Republican flag, the tricolour. It was uh, at the orders of General Liam Lynch, volunteers were ordered to use this flag because it, they, he was fearful that the uh, tricolour would be part of it, taken as part of the Commonwealth and a, a Union Jack would be stuck in the corner. And he issued orders to Ernie O'Malley saying, Ernie O'Cara, owing to the abuse of the tricolour by the Free Staters during the present hostilities, it has been decided that the Republican flag, when used by us, will bear the letters IR. You will issue an order that at least one flag will be flown in each battalion area of your command, Bear Bannock, Chief of Staff. We believe that it is most appropriate when commemorating the Republican forces, the soldiers of 22, that this flag should be present. 
bear with me, it's getting a bit windy here. We we'll now call upon uh, the, uh, sorry, we have four lilies to be laid in memory to symbolise Ulster, Munster, Leinster, and Connacht, the true Irish Republic. Good morning, Irish. We we'll now have a leaf to be laid on behalf of the National Graves Association, and if any of the groups have any wreaths to lay, please do so immediately after the wreath is laid for the National Graves Association. for that. Peggy Galligan will now come and read a prayer. Sorry, Peggy's going to read the poem, The Soldiers of 22. I sing no song of the long road, of the warriors staunch and bold, who bore their spears on the Irish hills, in the golden days of old, would I raise around for our own dear lads, the loyal, the brave and true, who flung their lives in the part of Wales, the soldiers of 22. When they heard the call of a cause laid low, they sprang to their guns again, and the pride of all was the first to fall, the glory of our fighting men. In the days to come, with their pipe and drum, we follow in the ways they knew, and their praise you sing, let the echoes ring with the memory of Cahal Gour. Brave Liam Lynch on the mountainside fell a victim to the foe, and Dilly Lacey for Ireland died in the glen of Aherlow. Neil Boyle and Quinn from the north came down to stand with the faithful few, and will sing their praise in the freedom days among the heroes of 22. Some fell in the proud red rush of war, and some by a treacherous blow, like the martyrs fought in Dublin town, and their comrades at drunk gold, and the haunted moor in the barrack squares, and by lonely roadsides too, without fear they died, and we speak with pride of the martyrs of 22. They were true to the right, they fought the fight, and they rested the peace of God, they took their hearts, for brave young men and march in the ways they thought. The cause still calls and call to them, and the task is the only true. But freedom comes to the land of love by the soldiers of 22. Peggy. Our piper will now play a lament and I'll ask the colour party while the lament has been played to lower the flags. Good morning. Good
commiseration, Paddy Lennon of the National Graves Association is going to read the proclamation of, the, of 1922. First of all, before he does, does that, I'll just read out the roll of honour of the volunteers who lost their lives in defence of the Republic in the, in the Four Courts or as a result of the Battle of the Four Courts. Volunteer Thomas O'Brien, Volunteer Joseph Considine, Volunteer Francis Jackson, Volunteer Sean Cusack, Sean Joseph Cusack, Volunteer Thomas Patrick Wall, and Volunteer Thomas Markey. How do you now come and read the proclamation of 22? Fellow citizens of the Irish Republic, the fateful hour, hour has come. At the dictation of our hereditary enemy, our rightful cause has been treacherously assailed by our cramped Irishmen. The crash of arms and the boom of artillery reverberate in this supreme test of the nation's destiny. Gallant soldiers of the Irish Republic stand vigorously firm in its defence and worthily uphold their noblest traditions. The sacred spirits of the illustrious dead are with us in this great struggle. Death before dishonour being an unchanging principle of our national faith as it was of theirs, still inspires us to emulate their glorious effort. We therefore appeal to all citizens who have withstood unflinchingly the oppression of the enemy during the past six years to rally to the support of the Republic and recognize that that resistance now being offered is but the continuance of the struggle that was suspended by the truce with the British. We especially appeal to our former comrades of the Irish Republic to return to that allegiance, thus guarding the nation's honour from the infamous stigma that her sons aided her foes in retaining a hateful domination over her. Confident of victory and maintaining Ireland's independence, this appeal is issued by the Army Executive on behalf of the Irish Republican Army. Signed, Commandant General Liam Mellows, Commandant General Rory O'Connor, Commandant General Joseph McKelvey, Commandant General Ernan Umwell, Commandant General Seamus Robinson, Commandant General Sean Boylan, Commandant General Michael Kilroy, Commandant General Frank Barrett, Commandant General Tomas Deering, Commandant Tom Barry, Colonel Commandant F. O. Fuelan, Brigadier General J. O'Connor, Commandant P. O. Rutilis, General Liam Lynch, Commandant General Liam D.C., Colonel Commandant Hader O'Donnell, for a moment. Today we have the pleasure of having an oration delivered by Dr. Tim Horgan of the National Graves Association. Tim is our representative in County Kerry. He's also a published historian on the 1916 to 23 period, particularly in his native county. He has edited and published the Kerry interviews of Ernie O'Malley, a senior Republican and member of the Four Courts Garrison, under the title of The Men Who The Men Will Talk to Me. His other books include Dying for the Cause, Kerry's Republican Dead, and Fighting for the Cause, Kerry's Republican Fighters. Tim is a member of the Bally CD Monuments Committee and is a frequent speaker at Republican commemorations in County Kerry and beyond. His grandmother was Madge Clifford, a member of the Four Courts Garrison and secretary to Liam Lynch and Ernie O'Malley. She was also the quartermaster general of Cumann Le Mans, a formidable lady of many secrets who remained faithful to the cause until the end. Dr. Tim Horgan. Now, I hope the rain stays away. Can you hear me, yes? For 750 years, England has ruled this country by force of arms. 
in this city on Easter Monday, 1916, the Irish Republic was declared on the steps of the GPO. Five years later, and following two years of guerrilla warfare, Britain conceded that Ireland could no longer be coerced, could no longer be subjugated, the croppies would no longer lie down. But our erstwhile colonial masters contrived that if Ireland could not be ruled by the Crown, then Ireland would be ruled for the Crown. It was the sound of artillery around this building a hundred years ago that ominously proclaimed that from that day forth, Ireland would be ruled not by Britain, but for Britain. The Irish Republic, conceived by the United Irishmen on Belfast Cape Hill, would now be destroyed by divided Irish men here on Dublin's Keys. Across these walls, 100 years ago, stood two armies. One, the Army of the Republic, was an army without banners, without uniforms, lightly armed, but resolute in their defense of that which generations had died for. Outside these walls stood a hastily assembled army, whose oath was to the king, whose uniforms were supplied by the British, who fired British rifles and artillery, and who served the policy of Britain and Ireland. England had declared that there would be no, no republic. It had been decreed that those loyal to that republic must be crushed, and this suppression will mercilessly begin where we have assembled here today. History records that a kilometre north of here, while a prisoner of war, died the father of Irish republicanism, Wolf Tone, but his cause lived on. A kilometre to the west of here in 1798, countless soldiers of the Republic were cruelly slaughtered and ignominiously buried in the Croppies Acre. Their cause did not die with them. A kilometre to the south of here on Thomas Street, Robert Emmett would be gruesomely executed for his loyalty to the Republic. But his defiant words still echo. A kilometre west of here, in O'Connell Street, the Irish Republic would be declared, but its enemies expected its brief, brief flame to be extinguished by the firing squads of Kilmainham and in the quicklime of Arbor Hill. But the fools, the fools, the fools. And so, in June 1922, by these granite walls, Irish men would attempt to do that which the British Empire failed to achieve. They would attempt to obliterate the Republican cause for once and for all. After the surrender at Easter week 1916, the defeated Republicans were marched up O'Connell Street to their captivity. Amongst them were Michael Collins and Sean McDiarmidab. Both had fought for freedom. One would be derided as being overly principled. The other would be praised for putting pragmatism above those principles. Passing the monument to Great Parnell, it would have served Collins well to have memorized the lost leader's inscribed words. No man has the right to fix a boundary to the march of a nation. No man has the right to say to his country, thus far thou shalt go and no further. But six years later, Collins did fix a boundary, not only to the march of a nation, but through that nation. Two states were formed, each to be ruled not by Britain, but for Britain. In the Northeast, a sectarian state in which bigotry would be regarded as being beneficial to those descendants who had shouldered pikes with Henry Joy McCracken and Henry Munro. The Southern states would require a new elite to rule it and control it. It was a state in which profit would outweigh principle, political power with the displaced patriotism. Top hats would replace black caps. Judges' wigs and gowns and bishops' mitres internments and firing squads would block that path to the Republic declared in 1916. Partition would be copper fastened. It would be thus far and no further for Ireland. An updated version of the Tudor's surrender and regrant policy. Liberty, equality and fraternity were to be consigned to quicklime. In 1919, Collins ordered the killing of the two Irish RIC men who had identified his comrades Sean McDiarmidale, brave McDiarmidale, whose last defying words were, damn your concessions England, we want our country. Would that Michael Collins would have uttered these words rather than fixing that boundary that still remains a barrier to the march of our nation. 
who was it really that betrays Sean McTiermada? Whatever his motivation in accepting Pax Britannia, Michael Collins had promised stepping stones to achieve national liberty. But all too soon, these stepping stones became headstones for those IRA volunteers who were killed in action around these granite walls. Collins's crimson stained stepping stones became memorial stones at Valley City and Countess Bridge, at Grey Abbey and Drumbo. Soldiers loyal to Ireland, faithful to the nation, became the enemies of this new state. These stepping stones became submerged in the blood of those who remained true to the old cause down through the last 100 years. The blood of Sean McCaughey and Charlie Kearns, the blood of Sean Sows and Fergie O'Hanlon, blood spilled in the Craigan, in Long Cash and at Lock Gall. Michael Collins had promised freedom to achieve freedom. But freedom for whom? And freedom to achieve what? Freedom for new landlords to rack rent. Freedom for big employers to exploit the working man. Freedom for banks to extort. Freedom for small farmers to emigrate. But certainly it was not the freedom to free Ireland. For 100 years the policy of London and that of the Irish state towards those who remained loyal to the cause of Tone and Emmett, the cause of Pierce and Connolly, has remained indistinguishable and intertwined. But to quote Sean O'Casey, that friend of those forgotten prisoners of the 40s, you cannot put a rope around the neck of an idea. You cannot put an idea up against a barrack square wall and riddle it with bullets. You cannot confine it in the strongest cell that your slaves could ever build. Though Collins, Mulcahy and O'Higgins, and later De Valera and Jerry Boland have attempted all of this, just as their British masters did before them, the old cause has refused to die. You commendably gather here today. You still remember. You seditiously refuse to forget. Today we are proud to commemorate those who stood defiantly within these walls. But who today recalls those who were outside these walls that June morning? Those who enthusiastically did Britain's bidding. Those Irishmen who covered their ears as they sent another shell into this building, while those with moral, moral authority covered their eyes. This commemoration gives proof to the fact that, is, that it is the defense of the 32 county Irish Republic that is remembered, and not the actions of those in dyed green British uniforms of the new 26 county state. We are told that we are nearing the decade of we are nearing the end of the decade of centenaries. The commemoration of what happened here in 1922, we are told, would be tricky and divisive. The government and its well-paid academics have decreed what should be remembered and what should not, what is worth commemorating and what should be forgotten, what aspects of our history satisfy present-day political requirements and what events might be embarrassing or inconvenient. But our history is not theirs to define, not theirs to edit. It is our history, a history composed of a myriad of unforgotten acts of resistance and defiance in a centuries-long struggle to maintain our distinct nationhood. The attack on the Fort Court garrison, the attack on those who had declared for a republic and would live under no other law, was an important event in our national history. But for many of you gathered here today, it is also an important part in your family history. So it is with me. Madge Clifford, my grandmother, joined Common Amon in 1913, gathered with her comrades to await Casement's weapons in Tralee in 1916. Fought in Dublin against the Black and Tans, and on the 28th of June 1922, she was here in the Four Courts. Madge stu stood beside General Liam Lynn's preparing a proclamation when the first shells landed near them. But, mistakenly enough, primed, they failed to explode. After the surrender, she was one of the few who escaped, carrying the garrison's documents and Joe McKelvey's suitcase. She would never see her friends, Liam Mellows and Rory O'Connor again, as she went on to defend the beleaguered Republic at the side of Ernie O'Malley and Liam Lynch. The wise men have told us their cause was a failure. They always do. They tell us that that was then, and it is different now. They draw lines through history. They tell us that the men of 1916 and the soldiers of 22 were totally different 
than those volunteers who fought in the last war of independence in the six counties. In 1971, Madge Tifford would write to the son of her dead comrade, General Ernie O'Malley. From this letter, I quote, the fight in the north is very bad. It is tough, but a lot of good young lads from the south are up there. I wish I were young again. I would go, and so would your father. To her, it was the same cause, the same fight. Her comrade in the Fort Courts Garrison, Maura, Tif Maura Comerford, would die in 1982 with her last effort supporting the H Block prisoners. The same cause, the same fight, steadfast women. Today's wise men will patronize the pronounce that there were two sides to the conflict. One side was as bad as the other. But there was not an equivalence between those who, the, who were within the fort court's walls and those attackers outside. There was a difference between those who fought for a proud unbroken nation and those who fought for a newly established state subservient to the British Empire. There was a difference between those who had taken an oath to the Republic and those who had sworn allegiance to the king. There was a difference between those, between those who fought for the Republic and those who sought to destroy it. There was a difference between the prisoners who were tied to a landmine in Valley City and those who detonated it. There was a difference between those who faced the firing squads and those who fired the deadly bodies. There was a difference between the teenage prisoners found dumped in Dublin's ditches and those who put British bullets in their heads. There was a difference between those who were tortured and their tormentors. There was a difference between the laws of God and the edicts of the bishops. There was a right side and a wrong side in the civil war. A right side and a wrong side. You gather here today because you are proud to declare which was the right side and which was the wrong side. Proud to remember what others would forget, what others would have you forget. To the easily persuaded Michael Collins and Arthur Griffith and those that followed them into the empire, Father Michael O'Flanagan would address the immortal words, they have fooled you again. They were indeed fooled by Britain. They were mesmerized by the trappings of power, seduced by their newly found status. They found it easy to sleep on other men's wounds. Indeed, the prophetic words of Patrick Pierce could be slightly modified to refer to these Irish men, those men who started the civil war here at the Four Courts at 4.20 a.m. on Wednesday, the 28th of June, 1922. The fools, the fools, the fools, they have left us more of our Fenian dead. While Ireland holds these graves, Ireland and free shall never be at peace. Garmaghle. Special thanks to Tim for that insightful oration. Before we finish up today, we're going to finish with the uh, playing of our round of Ian, but there's a couple of points before that. First of all, I'd like to thank everybody for coming today. Uh, Tim has pointed out the importance of events like this and how special it is for people when people attend it. We'd also like to thank our stewards and their uh, colour party, and we'd also like to thank Angarda Shikana for their assistance with today's event. The, uh, it's important to point out, we always reiterate the National Graves Association, that we respect the rights of all groups to commemorate the dead of all conflicts on all sides in a dignified and fitting manner. However, we do fiercely defend our right and the rights of other groups to commemorate Ireland's patriot dead, Ireland's Republican dead. And we believe that when we remember the past, those Irish men and women who fought for their country's freedom should hold a special pride of place. That's the norm in virtually every country in the world. It's really only in Ireland that you have some senior politicians who would argue for a parity of esteem between those who fought for the Republic and those who fought to stop them. Uh, I would ask also all of our uh, stewards today, who are also thanked today, if they would return the bibs to Seamus when we're finished today's event. Before the, the Piper plays Aaron on the vein, I'll just say that for anybody who wishes to follow the various uh, events of the National Graves Association, the various campaigns, it's, a, it, it's a quite clear to read on both the site, the organization's Facebook page and web page. So I'll now call upon um, our Piper, John Lamb, to play Aaron on the vein.
Chicago Glare.